to another episode of Eric Waite Whiskey Studies, and I have been really enjoying Texas Month. Um, and today I have the privilege of having none other than Dan Garrison of Garrison Brothers Distillery. So, Dan, why don't you say hello to everyone in the chat? Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us tonight, guys and girls. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I do get a few uh, women in the <laughs> in the chat who, who enjoy whiskey, particularly Amy. Amy, Amy, I know you'll be tuning in. So hi, Amy. So yeah, I know you'll be here. So um, I flew from California down to Austin, Texas. The great thing is I can get a late flight and I can get a direct flight. So I can leave here on a Thursday night, be there late Thursday night, and then start hitting distilleries on Friday. And my very first distillery that I actually went to was Garrison Brothers. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful estate, beautiful grounds, um, and they definitely do things Texas uh, style. So uh, thus far, I have already tasted, but I haven't posted any reviews yet. My reviews of these whiskeys, these bourbons will be coming up later on, but we are going to talk a little bit about them, sort of a preview to my reviews. Uh, this is one that's available. This is the Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Excuse me. Sorry. What? I know. Sorry. That's a faux pas. Yeah, that yeah, so whenever I say single malt, I always say single malt scotch. Even if it's a single malt from somewhere else, it, you get so used to that word just popping out of there. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem natural. So a Texas straight bourbon. And so this would be the first one. This one gets a little bit more widely distributed, a little more available. These <laughs> other two are distrib um, distillery only or only local distribution, correct? No, not really. Uh, the Garrison Brothers, you first touched on the small batch bourbon. That's our 2016 vintage. No, that's the one with the black wax top. Okay. Uh, that's the small batch bourbon whiskey. That one is available. It's actually sold out of every state it's been distributed to, with the exception of Tennessee. Uh, the only bottles we have left are in the state of Tennessee. So I'm not sure where you picked that up, but that's an older older bottle. I so I bought this I bought this here in California and it's been sitting on my shelf. I just hadn't gotten to it yet. Ah, uh, so yeah, you probably got it at BevMo or a or a Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh trade well total wine anymore. I don't like to advertise, but total we right now, total about two years ago because now all the California stores have the twenty eighteen or the twenty nineteen small batch bourbon whiskey in their stock, which is the oldest small batch bourbon we've ever done. So that bottle you have, that was a young one. That was only about three and a half years old. Okay. Did now I'd say signature. Did you actually hand sign these? That looks like it is JB Anderson, who's one of my assistant distillers. That means that I was out of town the day that they bottled that bourbon up and JD was signing the bottles for me. I try okay. to sign them all when I can. And then when I'm not there, my, our master distiller, Donna's Todd, takes over. Uh, problem is today we're doing about 250,000 bottles a year. Wow. So, and we can only do about 1,000 bottles a day, which means that we're bottling pretty much around the clock at the distillery. And it's just not realistic for myself or Donna's to always be there signing every bottle. So right. we have our other distillers to help us out. Right, right. So right now I have the Estacado in my glass. Absolutely love this one. Um, so this was the first one I actually opened. Um, this is one I, I bought here locally. We'll talk about more about that in a little bit. So um, I love the story of wine, the story of whiskey. I've got, you can't see them here on camera, but I've got a stack of books on a shelf here. I've got literally thousands of books off camera over there. I love the background story of whether it's you know, uh, wine or whiskey why people got onto the journey that they did, because, you know, as I say, it takes a, a, a large fortune to make a small fortune in either wine or whiskey. People go into it for passion, not because they think they're going to you know, get get rich of it. So tell us a little bit about your, your background and how you got into um, making bourbon and why Texas? I think most people spend most of their lives trying to discover what their real purpose is in life. Um, and the reason is that if you're doing something that you absolutely love and you're absolutely passionate about, it's no longer a job. It's something that you enjoy getting up and doing every single day. I stumbled into this career. I graduated from the University of Texas in 1989 with a degree in communications. I moved, immediately moved to New York City where I worked for about four years. My wife uh, asked me out on a blind date when I was in Manhattan one night. She flew in from Austin, Texas of all places where I am today. And we went out to dinner, uh, fell madly in love, and I knew I was coming back to Texas. I worked in Austin's advertising community for about five years. Uh, then I jumped ship, and that was right at the heart of the 
the internet uh, age where, you know, it was around 1995 and all of these businesses were starting up that were making sensational money just on stock options alone. And these guys were getting rich and here I am trying to support a family with two kids on about $35,000 a year advertising salary. So I went to work for a startup here in Austin called Extraprise and Extraprise was really the hottest uh, venture on the planet at that point in time. We went from four employees, I was the fourth employee, up to about 280 employees in about two years time. Um, my dream came true in 2001. The company was sold to a big California company called Commerce One, Silicon Valley company. And I was sitting on a whole bunch of stock options that were trading at a very high price. And all I had to do was wait six months, just six months. And then I could sell those stock options and ride off into the sunset on my new catamaran in the South Pacific. Um, only problem was we had one really large client at that company. Our beta customer was an oil and gas company out of Houston called Enron. Uh, you probably remember Enron. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when Enron went belly up, 17,000 Texans lost their jobs. I was one of them. Uh, I was right in my midlife crisis. I was 40 years old. And all of those stock options that I thought were going to be my retirement just went poof, and disappeared. So I was pissed off at the financial community and investors um, and because they all seemed to get away scot-free with their money and their, their, their riches intact. But the guys that were helping to build the business on the inside got nothing to show for it. So I decided to go get drunk in Kentucky for a week. I've been a Kentucky bourbon lover since I was 13 years old. And 13? When I walked into the Maker's Mark Distiller of Loretta, Kentucky, I went, oh, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. Oh. I uh, bought some, I got my, convinced my mother-in-law to buy a beautiful piece of property out in the hill country, uh, convinced a couple of my friends and my wife to invest in the business. And the next thing you know, I'm going out there on nights and weekends. I still had a day job back here in Austin, but I'm going out nights and weekends and I'm trying different mash bills. I'm trying different grain cook recipes. I'm trying different yeast, um, yeast strains and different humidities, different environments, different climates. Uh, different types of fermentation, open air fermentation, closed fermentation. I already knew how to make beer, so I had a little bit of a leg up on the process. Um, and now I just had to figure out how to distill. So then I called all those guys that I had met in Kentucky on that one trip. And I said, I'm coming back up. And I kept going back and forth to Kentucky. Over the period of uh, from 2004 until about 2006, I amassed about a dozen dear friends in Kentucky who were incredibly helpful along the way. Guys like Elmer T. Lee. Buffalo Trace Distillery. He was there for 45 years. We used to take him out for, for a steak at the local Applebee's, whatever I'd be in Frankfurt. Dave Pickerel had just left Maker's Mark when I when I was getting my, my business off the ground. And he just recently and, passed away. Yeah, yeah. It was a huge loss in the distilling community. He was a legend and probably the foremost historian of the bourbon whiskey heritage of, of Kentucky uh, in the country, um, beside maybe Chuck Cowdery, who was also a good friend. So, yeah, we lost Dave, but Dave actually spent two weeks down here with me and hi, uh, working my still with me. And I'd grill a mistake every night on the grill, and then we'd come back and we'd drink some, some whatever white dog I had or whatever bar right. thing. Or whatever. I remember when he, he was very involved with the uh, George Washington distillery at Mount Vernon, and he kept bringing me bottles back from that project of different uh, rye makes that he had uh, produced on George Washington stills. So the Kentucky community was very good to me. Um, there's a great guy named Drew Colesfeen who manages Kentucky Bourbon Distillers today. I think he's president. Uh, Bill Samuels was incredibly helpful to me. Rob Samuels has been helpful and I provided advice along the way. Craig Beam over at Heaven Hill. Um, those were the guys that helped me get off the ground and they helped teach me this art. And I consider myself an apprentice still. But I honestly have to say, I think I'm making some of the best bourbon whiskey in the world today, thanks to my incredible team that we have behind us. So it's funny you mentioned the the um, George Washington. I actually have a little bottle of White Dog from them yeah. uh, that one of my uh, associates brought back for me. And I said, hey, next time you're back there in Virginia, you got to bring back a regular bottle, not just a, you know, a, a sample of a White Dog. So one of the things... You know, coming from a wine background uh, and is a sense of place. Um, and studying wine, passing for exams, you have to learn how to blind taste and all that kind of thing, is to recognize the difference between, you know, how a Cabernet Sauvignon is like from uh, Napa Valley, from Bordeaux, from Australia, from Argentina, and so forth. 
And one of the things I've noticed, particularly, you know, in in your bourbons and, and Iron Roots bourbons and so forth, is this is not uh, just a Southern Kentucky. You know, it's it's they really really are different. Um, not just in terms of intensity uh, and, and the aging process, but one of the things I've noticed, particularly in this one. So when I'm in a place, I'm really, really observant of all my surroundings. So years ago, I went up to Mendocino. I've been to every wine region in the state of California, all over Oregon. And I was up in Mendocino. And even though it was a really hot day, I'm visiting wineries. I drove down, I rolled down my window. I was driving through the hills to get to wineries and I was smelling, 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 smelling because I wanted to smell the trees. I wanted to smell the brush and everything else because I knew even if it's just a small way, that would somehow be reflected in the wines I was going to have. And so I did the same thing at your distillery. Uh, it was a, The weather was a little challenging. It had been raining off and on, uh, but uh, I – you have an interesting road getting up to um, um, sort of like where there's a tasting room at and there's sort of a visitor center. And then there's a road that goes all the way up to the distillery up on, on top of the hill. Yep. But one of the things I was noticing, I was really smelling the trees uh, on your property and the dirt. because And it helps when it rained because it rained kind of. Was that about a month ago? Was that April time frame? Yeah, it was, it was, in, it was in April. Yeah, we had an amazing amount of rain. We've had three months of, of, of historic downfall all across the state. We've had some storms that have blown out bridges and, and uh, flooded out roads. So it's a very verdant uh, hill country spring this year. We've had an amazing wildflower outburst of, um, coming out of the ground. The blue bonnets, the, the paintbrushes are absolutely gorgeous right now. So we picked a good time to come to the great state of Texas. Uh, it was great. But if you're used to driving in California weather, it was a little frightening. Mm -hmm. But what I was getting at is I was smelling your property as I was going up there. Mm -hmm. And I actually get, particularly on this one, because uh, it is a little bit younger, I get a youth, uh, and I'll get more into this during my, my, my formal review. I get a youthfulness there, but there's a distinctive character to it. And I watch some, uh, some other reviews, and they talk about the herbalness and the sage and these, these kind of wildness. But those people who other people haven't reviewed it haven't been to your property. I yeah. have. And what I, what I was getting is this smells like it. This smells. I get some of your property. I get your trees. I get your surrounding area, uh, particularly on the mid to the back end of this whiskey. And I thought, wow, this, it, that alone makes it so different from Kentucky. It's a hearty bourbon. It's an oily bourbon. Um, we want you to taste the flavor from the grain. We also want you to taste the oils that come from the wood. Uh, when we're maturing bourbon whiskey here in Texas, that bourbon has multiple seasons inside the wood, um, but it also extracts and breaks down the wood sugars at a much richer, faster pace than most other states uh, because this climate out here is so bone dry and it is so freaking hot. It's 110 degrees for about four months out of the year in summers here in Texas. And that causes, in my humble opinion, the wood to literally de deteriorate and decompose inside the barrel. And it becomes a little bit of a syrup. Um, the, sh the wood sugars become syrup. The fruit through all the guy called the oak lactin, the vanillin. And when we distill it, we distill it at a very low, low proof so that we capture the essence of that grain and once you marry that with those wood sugars that come out of the oak over time, um, you're looking at something that's a rich, syrupy, heavy, oily bourbon. Unlike anything I've ever tasted, I have had a very I had, I had a delicious barrel that was handpicked by a Houston restaurant, um, and it was about 1792 from Barton Brands, and it was absolutely spectacular. But I've never tasted anything other that's remotely similar to what we're getting here in High Texas. That's not, you know what, that's not true. My friends at Balcones, who are good friends of ours, and we've been competitors for a long time, but we right. also have a lot of respect for each other. They're making a very nice young, it's young, but it's a very nice bourbon today. It does have some similarities. So, so you think maybe that, well, that herbal, see, but there is sort of an herbal sage character to it that 
and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, it doesn't seem to me to be as, yes, from oak, but I, but it seems to me also, it re, or maybe it just reminds me, and I'm being romantic, it does remind me of the place of the distillery as well, not just a, 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 a microwaved intensity interaction with the wood as well. Well, a lot of our native flowers are called purple sage. Perhaps that's wafting through the barrels and bringing it out in it. I think, well, if, if well, Isla, if you think of Isla, if Isla can have a briny character to it coming off the ocean for their whiskeys, I would see that it's it, it, the same possibility um, that uh, your surroundings are sure. also getting in there as well. And if and the thing is, one thing I noticed is years ago, before I went in the Marine Corps when I was a wee lad, I worked at a, in, a, in a bakery. And everybody would come in and say, oh, your bread smells so good. Well, because I was there all the time, I didn't smell it anymore. Because I was around the French rolls and the croissants and everything. So yeah. they could smell it more than I could because I've sort of become used to it. So I just, I wonder if, if you become used to your environment, that me coming from California, I noticed maybe as an outsider, might even notice it a little bit more because it's so different from what I'm accustomed to. Well, as you know, with your, 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 knowledge of bourbon whiskey you know there's only three ingredients that are going into it that's the water the grain and the wood there's right no, there's no artificial colors there's no there's no red dyes that you can add to it there's no vanilla extract or anything like that if you do that it's no longer a bourbon whiskey right and we follow the letter, letter of the law pretty stupidly at garrison brothers there's never been anything doctoring our bourbon so all of that is coming from the the, the terroir itself right right Right. So, yeah, because these definitely have a, a unique, all of the three of them, a distinctive character that to me says, I'm from Texas and makes them different from uh, from, from Kentucky. So um, we before we went, we started recording, I, I told you a little bit about my background, being a veteran, my, my father being a veteran, um, and my brother being a, so my grandfather was the Navy, Naval officer, my dad in Second World War. My uh, father was in the, the Korean War. My one of my older brothers was in Desert Storm in the Air Force, and I was in uh, the Marine Corps. I noticed you have a very strong sort of veteran presence uh, there uh, at the distillery well, and, and I really, really like that. We hire vets. We know that vets are going to work. They've, they've been working hard their whole life, um, and we can expect that from them. They bring a sense of um, determination to fix anything that breaks before they call a consultant. We don't believe in consultants. We don't call consultants. We fix it ourselves when we get back to work. Uh, there's a sense of attitude amongst our staff that um, we are going to create a worldwide iconic bourbon brand that when we travel around the world, we can get it anywhere we go. Um, and it motivates us every single day. And those veterans work their asses off and they, they can fix anything. So uh, I, like you, also wanted to go into the military. Uh, I told my dad when I was a junior in high school that I wanted to enter the Naval Academy. He laughed and he scoffed at me and said, you don't have the grades, son, and you're just not smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is he was right. At the time, I didn't have the grades. I wasn't applying myself enough. Uh, and so, and I didn't know a whole lot of senators or representatives that were going to nominate me for the Naval Academy either. So um, I didn't go to, to, to war for this country. I didn't uh, fight for this country. And it's always been a little bit of a tinge of regret. So I want to do anything I can to help out those who have fought for our country. And we appreciate it. So I served, just in, I served in peacetime. Uh, Desert Storm started just after I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps and just started, I went to college, started, started college. Uh, but my brother served, I just did one term, you know, four years in the Marine Corps. My brother did nine years in the Air Force. Um, some of the guys that I had served with in the Marine Corps, they still had their, um, they, there's like inactive duty. They, so they got sort of recalled back in the Marine Corps uh, to go serve. Thankfully, all those friends uh, uh, made it back. So um, anyway, so thank you for uh, hiring veterans because um, we definitely uh, appreciate it. So with all the different types of whiskeys, and everything you could do, um, some distilleries will do bourbons. Well, some will also do, you know, white spirits, vodkas and vodkas and gins as they're, as they're waiting for their, um, you know, brown spirits, you know, whiskeys to age. You've really focused in on uh, bourbon. Have you ever considered doing something other than just bourbon, or is there a particular reason why you chose just bourbon 
Um, talk to me a little bit about your prof profile in that fashion. Um, we're, we're always going to do bourbon and we're always going to do straight bourbon. Um, our, we, we suffered through uh, about four years of our business um, where we had no revenue coming in whatsoever except for t-shirt sales. So um, we, we suffered through that period. We knew that that period was going to be there. Um, and I kept a day job through that entire time right. because um, we knew that there, we're waiting on our bourbon. Once our bourbon's ready, it's ready. We can't rush it. There's nothing we can do to rush the maturation process. So um, we released our first bottles in 2010, and they instantly sold out. And the two guys that worked for me at the time, I looked around, and we looked at each other, and we said, now what do we do? So we bought a bigger still, and we went back to the drawing board and started making more bourbon. We sold a little bit more in 2011, a little bit more in 2012. Another still lands in 2010 or 11. So we've got now two stills operating in addition to our original 100 gallon still. And then uh, last year, we decided to double down again. And we bought one of the, the largest copper pot stills in North America from, from Vindum Brass and Copper Works. Uh, it's a 2,000 gallon still. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. And it's producing a, about 320 gallons of white dog every single run that we do off of it. Uh, we named that one the Big Johnson. Right, right. Not because of what you think. We had a president that lives right down the road from me. Oh, okay, okay. Ben Johnson, who was a tall guy, so it still became the big Johnson. But you also have two others. One is um, Fat Boy. We have, we have one still called Fat Man and one still called Little Boy because they're awesome yes. displays of American might. Right, right. <laughs> so um, one of the things I like – I think consumers, whiskey tubers, we like transparency. We want to know what's going in there. And one of the things I appreciate is uh, on the side here, uh, you said number one, pen handle white. Now, for wines, for you know, you have Cabernet Sauvignon, but then you have all kinds of uh, sub varieties, various clone varieties. You know, so if you get real geeky, it's not just you know Pinot Noir, but it's a you know a particular clone of it. So can you tell me a little bit about Panhandle White? Is there a particular advantage to that one? I wish I could give you more specifics. Back in uh, 2008 and 2009, when Dave was still around, and Dave was uh, you know, my friend that I could call for advice, he had recommended just a tr uh, typical standard, oh, excuse me, it's late here in Austin, um, it's typical standard yellow dent corn. And we sourced that. I went to my next door neighbor who lives down the road from me here, and she's the vice president of procurement for Whole Foods Market. And I said, Betsy, I want to buy some corn from Texas that's raised here in Texas. I want it to be completely organic. Uh, is there a, a provider or a grower or a co-op that you would recommend that I work with? She recommended a group out of Dalhart, Texas called uh, Def, Deep Smith Family Grain. Um, I went up there. I met with them. I brought bags of their yellow dent corn back to, to Texas and tried it on my stills. And I was getting approximately maybe... 16% sugar at the end of a, of a cook. Um, and then one day I ordered a truckload of it. And instead of sending me the yellow dent corn, they sent me this white corn. Well, I've never tried white corn before, and I was a nervous wreck to try it. But I was sure shit couldn't afford to send it back to, to Dalhar, Texas. So we took the order. We accepted the order. And I'm looking at these kernels and digging handfuls of these kernels out of the bed of the truck. And this white corn is plumper and juicier and bigger and fuller than these kernels of the yellow dead corn that I had. I said, well, what the hell? We'll give it a shot. Sure enough, our fermentation rates were 19% uh, bricks of sugar content at the end of five days of fermentation off of the, the white corn. And I loved the flavor. of It It was uh, a little bit mellower. It, it, it had a sweeter flavor than the, the yellow dip did. So we never went back. I would use that corn ever since. The term panhandle white means it came from the panhandle and it's white. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the seed manufacturer, whether that was Pioneer or, or another seed manufacturer. And the problem is that when you buy corn in bulk like we do today, we're doing literally you know, 5,000 or no, no, 10,000 pounds of grain a month, I think. Uh, something maybe a quarter million pounds a year, or 10,000 10, pounds a week, a quarter million a year. Uh, when you buy in bulk like that, you really don't have a whole lot of control over who grew it and what type of seed was used. Because it's all going to be co-mingled at the co-op. It's all going to be bagged together at the co-op. They don't bag one farmer's um, crop 
and then another farmer's crop because there's all there are, they are also the sale entity that sells it to the Midwest grain co-ops or sells it to the, the markets in Chicago. So you're buying from a co-op which which brings farmers together to share their seed. So and then this is from it says uh, Dallam County. Yes, sir. That's uh, that's near Dalhart, Texas. Okay. 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 So um, one of the things I'm really really noticing about these, and it, it, I always always think in terms of if I was blind tasted on this, and I had other bourbons next to each other, what about this would make me say? This Eric, one's from Texas. Eric, you don't want to do that. That's what I did for so many years. And <laughs> unfortunately today, that's all I drink is Garrison Brothers because I've become so addicted to it. So right. I don't want to ruin your whiskey experience. I mean, look behind you. You've got everything there. And then if, next time we come on this episode, there'd be nothing but Garrison Brothers behind you on the shelf. And I don't want to, I don't want to make that mistake with you. <laughs> I love my bourbon. I think my bourbon probably compares most closely to a Blanton's or possibly, if you're talking Kentucky bourbons, that is. Right. Blanton's and Albert T. Lee and W.L. Weller, 12-year-old, and Happy Van Winkle. It's a very similar recipe to those guys, and I know it is because they helped me uh, figure out how to come up with this recipe. Um, as far as other bourbons, it's not even close to a maker's mark. It's much older than, than maker's mark is. It's much richer and oilier than maker's mark is. Uh, so I, I compare it to a Blanton's 1792 for Barton. I can't figure that one out because it really did taste a little bit like mine, even though it's got a very dissimilar mash bill, and I think it's even got rye in it. But uh, this is a weeded bourbon. Uh, all we do is weeded bourbons. We have 31 barrels in our barn that we're experimenting with. Um, each of those barrels is a different rye recipe. But rye is a much more dense grain, and rye right. takes long, longer time to a sterificate, a sterify inside the, the barrel. Um, it can take years for that sweetness to come out and rye, and ours is not there yet. So so all the spice is wood spice, not grain spice. Well, it's wood spice and cloves and cinnamon that's coming from the fear for all, the diacol, right. the, 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 the fear for all, and the, I, I said, I said eugenol. That's all. That's what's giving you the spice flavors that you're tasting. Okay. So the one I'm really, really enjoying right now um, is this Estacado. Uh, where did the name Estacado come from? You're in California, right? Uh, no uh, habla espanol. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ask because uh, that is a distillery release only. You can only get bottles of that at our gift shop. That was a collaboration project with a winery here in Texas, an uh, old school winery that's been around since the 1970s called Llano Estacado. It's up on the Texas Plains in Lubbock, Texas. Um, they were one of the first earliest uh, wineries in Texas. They approached us at one point and said that they wanted to get some bourbon barrels from us to age a Cabernet Sauvignon wine in it. And we said, sure, we have plenty, but we're not going to give them to you. We're not going to sell them to you. We want to trade. Uh, so they gave us 20 port casks, and these are heritage port casks. They've been used in for, at Dano Estacado for, for 25 years. Wow. So they've got a lot of port soaking into the, the wood and they gave us 20 casks we gave them 20 bourbon casks we aged that bourbon that you see there before you're tasting for three years in a new white american oak barrel from a cooperage and kilt in uh in uh, louisville kentucky and then we transferred that liquid into the auto estacado port casks and aged it for another year um we've sim we're just about to release the 2019 estacado but it will, it will only be available at the gift shop at the distillery Okay. That, I believe, if you look at that closely, it's going to say 107 proof on it. I think that's what it came uh, out of. 53.5, 107 proof, correct. Yeah. Uh, that's what it came out of the portcast gap uh, two years later after it been sitting in that portcast. Okay. So I don't think that, that one's a funny little animal because when you drink it down, it's like a warm blanket of butterscotch and caramel and vanilla like, like most Garrison Brothers bourbons are. And then when you burp, you taste a little wine. <laughs> so one of the things I like about this and I haven't had a lot of port uh, aged or finished bourbons. I've had maybe half a dozen or so. And one of the things that I like about this that some others don't do, a lot of them have, it's kind of like you're getting bourbon. And in terms of from, from beginning to finish, you get bourbon, bourbon, bourbon. And then the port sort of kicks in at the end. And a lot of these other ones, so they're not really integrated. This one I find the bourbon notes and the port notes are integrated. And yet, it doesn't lose its distinctiveness as a 
uh, bourbon. It has a really nice integration of these two different. Uh, it has a nice development of, of flavor, and yet you can still – it didn't – the bourbon character didn't get washed out by the port, and the port didn't get lost with the bourbon. They're still doing justice to both sources of flavors. It's well integrated. I, I just – I've not found that with another bourbon that has been uh, either aged in or finished in port. Most of the port tends to take over or just sort of lingers in the background. I really, really like this. If it uh, doesn't still taste like straight bourbon, then it's not coming from Garrison Brothers Distillery. Right. We make straight bourbon, that's all they ever make. Uh, the best example of that is the most recent handcrafted experimental we did, uh, kind of at my wife's request. It's called Honeydew. And she always wanted a bourbon that had a little bit of honey flavor to it. So this was Donis Todd's uh, master experiment um, as he became our master distiller. And what he did is he actually cut up a whole bunch of bourbon barrels into tiny little cubes. He immersed them into uh, uh, Burleson's Texas wildflower honey. Uh, they soaked in that pot day after day after day after day. And then he built a giant tea bag out of cheesecloth. And he put all the cubes inside, the honey-infused cubes. And he dipped that cheesecloth into a tank of good four-year-old bourbon whiskey for about six months. So it just gave it a little hint of bourbon. It's right. not sugary or sappy or, 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 or nasty like some of those those Kentucky flavored bourbons uh, that we just right. made right. in my right. stomach. Um, you know, you drink that and you're like, oh, my God, I need a glass of water afterward because it's just so much sugar coming off right. of it. And I tried that one at the distillery and I really liked it. And I kind of thought of it, you know, it's it can be challenging, at least, at least it can be challenging on hotter days to have higher alcohol uh, whiskeys. But I found that one to be, I thought, you know what, this would probably be a really nice uh, summer day hanging on the porch sort of sipper. I really, really did like that one. Or even um, almost like an after dinner uh, uh, bourbon as well. I really, really like that. It's really nice. Yeah, it's really nice and some vanilla ice cream. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Although, um, one of the things, and I know a lot of people stick their tongue out of me or shake their head, you know, whatever at me. But if you can get fifty and above ABV bourbons, I do like to cool it down a little bit. Um, I think I don't lose a ton of flavor. I'm not sticking it in the freezer. It's not getting that freaking cold. Uh, but I do like to cool it down in a rocks glass uh, with one ice cube. Um, and cool it down just a little bit. I kind of enjoyed it that way as well. I know everybody goes, heretic, heretic, but sometimes that's the way I, I like them. And you can do that with higher ABV. It's your bourbon. You bought it. You can drink it anywhere you want to go. Damn, 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 damn straight. Damn straight. So um, what have you got going on in terms of what's coming on down the pike? Oh, by the way, so, and I tell people, when I went to Scotland, you know, when I got there and you go to either a whiskey bar or somewhere, you go, never seen that, never seen that, can't get it, can't get it, can't get it, can't get it. It's amazing how much is over there. You never see in the United States and you can't get it. So I actually brought back 24 bottles from Scotland in my dirty underwear. Right. <laughs> and That's terroir. <laughs> so, so I always tell people, get out there, um, visit distilleries, get out there because – you're going to find things locally that don't get out of the local area. You know, the, the larger production, they can distribute, but there's going to be some great stuff that you can only get either at the distillery or maybe at a local shop, maybe only at a, a local bar. So what have you got that people should really come out and visit you uh, that is only available locally? I think I've got a, at least a couple of them here. So we've got a couple of interesting projects in the works. One of them is called our single barrel program. That bourbon bottle on your right with the silver wax, that's called Garrison Brothers Single Barrel Bourbon. Uh, you can Every week we bring down a new barrel to our gift shop, and you can taste that barrel. It's the only one that our gift shop folks like. They're the ones that get to select that barrel, uh, along with our master distiller, Donna Todd. That one, that was, oh, here we go. Oh, it's going to be 94 proof um, at the gift shop. We're also doing a custom barrel selection program. We've sold about 400 barrels this year where people will actually come to the distillery and they'll we stick them in the barn with our master distiller with me. And we're going to drill holes in all these barrels until we find a barrel that they like. We'll put a little glass underneath it, capture the bourbon that comes shooting out of the hole, usually all over your clothes as well, which is not a bad way to go. And if they find a barrel they like, we're going to bottle up all the 
their bourbon in that barrel for them and they're going to ship it to their favorite liquor store. Uh, and that's where they'll actually go buy it. They can also bring a whole bunch of friends with them. And we can bottle the bourbon up on the very same day, uh, bottle it up, put a little custom tag on it that says hand selected by Jimmy Russell and his friends, um, and it'll ship off to their liquor store. And you can choose barrel proof or you can choose 94 proof in honor of Elmer TV, your choice. But you also have something where people can actually come to the distillery and do a hand dipping party and bottle their own, right? Exactly. That's what exactly what I'm talking about. That's okay, right, right, right. That looks, looks like a lot of fun. And so, unfortunately, next year, we've sold so many of those barrels this year that we're running out of days to do it. Literally, I think 300 out of 365 days this year, we've had somebody on the ground selecting a barrel. We just don't have the manpower to accommodate that. So next year, we're going to start limiting the number of barrels that are part of the program. Okay. There's one thing I wanted to commend you on. I want to thank you very much, sir. So there's a particular bourbon, great bourbon, uh, like the contents, affordable, but it's got wax on it and it's got so much freaking wax on it. It's a pain in the ass to get off. It's a, I did a live show trying to undo this particular bourbon. It was a nice bourbon. Nothing gets wrong with the bourbon. But I was just getting frustrated how much, and it, you know, I ended up with black stuff all over the place. Right. I love the way you guys do this. It has the beauty of of uh, of the wax. I love I love the style, and it comes down starts to, starts to come down over the shoulders, and yet uh, it looks like a leather strap you got in there, and it comes off so easy, so clean, and so neat. Um, and, and I mean, it's just a clean strip. And I'm like, why in the hell isn't anybody else who uses wax do this? Because I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It was brilliant. Uh, that was a lot of trial and error. We probably tried over 100 different types of material for our tear strip. Um, finally, we just used deer skin lace that we found from a company called Tandy Leather Company. The okay. running joke is that there's so many deer along the highways in Texas that if we ever run out of that lace, we can just head down to the highway and shovel one into the back of our truck, uh, bring it back up and use the deer skin lace there from that. But we actually get it from a called Tandy Leather Company. And the deer skin works really well. It doesn't spray plastic black wax all over the place. You don't have to re ice your drink to start over again to get the wax in it. Right. Oh, it just tears really smoothly and it gives it kind of a rustic feel, which is right. what we're all about. Right. And, and I mean, the one thing about waxing is it's hard to, you know, if someone wanted to refill it with some plunk and sell it off as a fake, it's a little hard to re duplicate that. Um, and, and, and cover it up. So it's a, it's a unique way of um, protecting the integrity of, of the bottle as well. But all three of these are open, and all of these were really, really easy. Uh, so I, I, anyway, kudos, sir. Um, Thank you. I wish everybody else would do that. I really, really ap appreciate that. All righty. So uh, we've been on for just a, a little bit uh, under an hour. Um, I want to tell everyone who's watching this, either on the premiere or on the replay, if you get down to Texas, you got to check out Garrison Brothers. Beautiful property. Really nice tour. Really, really enjoyed it. Fantastic bourbons. Beautiful place. And you also have, because they were doing things like, um, I don't know if they were like cocktails, but they had like other things that you could sort of drink there as well, right? Sure. Um, all of our volunteers that are there bottling up their, their, their bourbon or helping us bottle the bourbon, we have over 16,000 people on our wait list to come out and volunteer with us. We we have about 25 new friends that join the, the distillery every day to do that. Um, we have a philosophy that good bourbon can change the world. And I see it every single day. These volunteers, they get there in the morning and they're nervous and they're looking around at each other with these shifty eyes and trying to figure out what this guy over here, what the hell he's wearing, what, what's his hair doing. And this guy over here has got tats all over his body. And the guy over here has got piercings all through his, his nose and ears. And everybody's kind of checking each other out. We've got the retirees over here and the business professionals over here. And we give them a shot of courage every half hour to keep them motivated. There you and go. Usually by noon, they're all best friends. Uh, they The friendships endure. Uh, at night, they go out to dinner all together at the end of the night to drink more bourbon at the local restaurants in the Fredericksburg High area. And bourbon can build enduring friendships. It can also strengthen your faith in man and God. Um, and it can create legendary stories. So we really believe that bourbon can change the world, and I see it every damn day. Uh, but that's part of it. That's what it's all about is, is, is drinking with new friends and getting to know people. Absolutely. Hey, so I want to encourage everyone, hey, get down to Texas. you got to check out the scene. If you can find a, a bottle locally at your local store, definitely pick it up, check it out. But 
you're going to find some really, really good stuff there. You're going to find some really nice Texas hospitality. It's a really fantastic experience. Highly, highly uh, recommend it. All right. I want to thank everyone for uh, watching. Um, Dan, man, this has been absolutely awesome. Um, I'm definitely, I'll be down in your neighborhood again. Uh, this is not my first time down to Texas, so we'll, we'll meet up again. But I want to thank you very much for coming on. Come back soon, Eric. We'll roll out the red carpet for you. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good night and cheers. Cheers. Have a good night. Hey, if you like my review, be sure to check out these other whiskey videos.